Welcome to The Investing Show, where we discuss the news that matters to investors. I'm Simon Lambert of This Is Money, and joining me on today's show, I've got Richard Hunter of Interactive Investor. Richard, welcome to the show. Hi, Simon. Now, it's been a topsy-turvy few weeks for investors, but actually, the FTSE 100 has been pretty stable over the past month. Uh, and indeed, if you look at the statistics, it is now up by more from its lowest point at the end of March than it is down from the peak that it reached in the middle of January. There's been about a 19% fall from that peak, and we are up 25% from that uh, low point in March time. Uh, if you look over to the US, the S&P 500 is down a, a little bit on the year, but not that much, only about 5%. And actually, astonishingly, is higher now than it was a year ago. Which begs the question for investors, Richard, is the worst over and done with? Is, is this the recovery? Have we already missed the boat on trying to, to get that, that first bit of the leg up? Well, we, we may well have missed the boat in terms of the first stage of the recovery. Um, certainly what we're seeing is um, unbridled optimism in the States at the moment. Um, we, we knew that the first quarter reporting figures um, were going to be fairly poor, but, but on a sort of fractional basis, it was only really March that was kicking into those figures, but it was a sign of things to come. We're now, of course, in the final month, the second quarter uh, in June, uh, and it's widely expected again that the uh, second quarter f n uh, numbers coming from companies are going to be pretty woeful. But I think if you look at um, those recoveries that you mentioned, particularly in the US markets, investors are now um, starting to look through the fact that the second quarter is going to be uh, a write-off. The fact that um, unemployment is somewhere around 20%, 30 to 40 million unemployed potentially in the US, so the sort of figures you haven't seen um, since the Great Depression. And of course, even as we speak, you've got the topicality uh, of another degeneration uh, potentially between the US and China, something that was a big factor in 2019. And of course, laterally, the, um, the, the general civil unrest and riots that we're seeing over the last couple of days, none of which has done anything uh, to derail that sense of optimism in the States. In fact, quite apart from the S&P that you mentioned, if you look at the NASDAQ index, the technology laden index, that's now actually up 6.5% in the year to date. It's, it's as though uh, March, March in particular, uh, COVID-19 just didn't happen. Which begs the question somewhat is, are investors getting ahead of themselves here? Are they underestimating the challenges that we face? Um, I mean, there's any number of statistics that we could pull out of the air to talk about it. I guess over here in the UK, we could mention the eight and a half million people who've been furloughed the concern that there's going to be jobs cut once companies have to start picking up the wages. We could talk about the figures from the SMMT that showed 99% less cars manufactured um, over the course of a month. Um, in the US, we can, we can talk about the, the huge jump in, in unemployment. Um, there's all kinds of numbers being bandied around. And there is the, there is the question of whether what we get now is the the shock from that we've already had the shock from coronavirus and the lockdown but then we now get the shock from that and maybe we start to see some businesses going bust and if we do start to see businesses going bust is that going to shake up investors a little bit more i think it's uh, that's inevitable um i mean the fact of the matter is although we've not got the official figures yet we all know uh, that the uk for example is in a recession um there, there's just no question about that although obviously uh, the politicians are avoiding that word for the moment. Um, similarly, in the US, apart from the unemployment numbers and the unemployment rate, um, as we've been speaking about, I suspect there's going to be some fairly negative shocks coming through um, as we get to the end of June and the second quarter reporting season starts to begin in a way that the market probably hasn't been factoring in. I mean, um, obviously, in terms of the economic data you mentioned, that is effectively driving in the rear view mirror, but at the same time, uh, it's a good indication of what's actually happening on the ground. Now, 
um, the ultimate op optimists will probably point to the fact that the likes of China, for example, uh, are starting to stage uh, something of a recovery in as much as you can believe the figures that uh, they're currently putting out. Um, so then it becomes the question, as we mentioned before, of the um, alphabet soup um, in terms of what shape the, uh, the recovery might take. And at this particular moment, and it can change, as we've seen before, um, confidence in the market takes a long time to build up but can be destroyed very, very quickly indeed. I suspect there will be quite a few shocks coming through, particularly uh, in July as we start to get those corporate numbers, which could shake sentiment. One of the positives, I guess, however, is that when we do see uh, companies reopening for business, when we do see shops reopening for business, um, when we do see uh, fast food chains even, they're doing pretty brisk business, aren't they? I mean, they are reporting that they've got quite a lot of interest. Um, it goes to show that if you shut a KFC for long enough, you will build up pe you will build up pent up demand. Um, even estate agents have said they've been really busy over the past couple of weeks. With, after everybody's been stopped from going and looking at houses over the traditional house spring house buying period, whether going and looking at houses translates into actually buying houses is another matter. I would caution. But can we take some some positives from from that brisk business that people are doing? I, th I think we can. Um... Obviously, now that car showrooms are open as well, there's the ability to go out on a, a test drive on your own, uh, which seems a, a reasonably risky strategy. But even so, um, it does go to show that there is an element of pent-up demand. It will be really interesting to see how that translates to the travel industry, um, because certainly uh, on an anecdotal basis, I'm sure you've been hearing the same, there are many people not quite yet ready to either um, get into a plane or indeed visit another country until there's um, some more uh, some more normality that has returned. So um, yes, it could potentially result in a, an increase in UK staycations, uh, but it will nonetheless be very interesting to see uh, how the travel industry uh, will be affected over the well, basically over the remainder of the year. Mm. And one interesting thing I read a, a few weeks back was from Nick Train, the, the fund manager, Finsbury Growth and Income Trust manager, amongst others, who, who said in a note to investors that the reason why he's continuing to back some of the, the luxury brands that he's invested in, such as Burberry and also some of the, you know, the, the, the big name uh, alcohol brands, the, the Diageos, et cetera, of this world, is because he expects there to be a, a, a burst of hedonism at the end of this, of that people have been impacted and their finances have been impacted very hard, but there are others who haven't been impacted so hard and, and actually may have even been saving some money and that they're going to be gagging to get out there and spend some of it, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, I think, I think you're right. And even, even if that were to happen in the, next, in the next couple of months, with the UK, for example, being in a, a recessionary period, the fact remains that for a lot of the, the high-end luxury goods, the kind of people that are buying the high-end luxury goods are rather less affected by the recession, but have simply been waiting uh, for an opportunity, as, as you say, to get out there and spell it. The likes of Burberry have had a particularly difficult time uh, over the last nine months or so. There was that US-China trade spat always in the background. Then, of course, we had the Hong Kong riots. Uh, around the turn of the year as well, let alone COVID more recently. So Burberry really has been up against it because it's got a big Asian presence. Um, and a lot of the Asian tourists in Europe have also been something of a success story for it as well. But nonetheless, uh, in terms of what Nick Train is saying in principle, um, we can all hope there'll be hedonism. Um, but as we've been discussing, there are already some elements of, of pent up demand being in place. And we saw some Bank of England figures um, today where it shows that people have been, been busy not borrowing on their credit cards and, and paying down some of their debts, didn't we? Yes, we did. And it's, it's really interesting and, and very unusual. Uh, but I guess um, one of the reasons we could probably ascribe to that is simply that if you're spending less on the basis that you, you've been locked down, I mean, obviously you've still got the facility to to spend online, but as the next CEO said at their recent results, uh, people aren't going to buy a new outfit to stay in. Um, it could well be that the money that's being saved either through that, that lower purchasing power or indeed the cost of the commute to the office, uh, the additional cost of going out for sandwiches, etc. when you're at the office, these things start to build up uh, and perhaps the uh, 
the UK consumer has decided this is a, an ideal opportunity which might not come again for some time uh, just to reduce some of their credit card spending and general debt. Mm. And looking at from the investment perspective for people who are looking at perhaps buying into some individual companies thinking that they might like to ride out some of this recovery, I guess all of the things we're talking about highlight why people need to be very picky about where they invest now rather than just thinking that this is going to be the kind of recovery where a, a wave of cheap money lifts all boats. Yeah, I mean, it depends uh, as ever on the risk appetite of the uh, individual investor. Obviously, some have been going gung-ho into any stocks, diagnostic stocks or biopharmaceutical stocks, which might have anything to do with COVID and, and either testing let alone the vaccine. And there have been some spectacular success stories. Uh, but in terms of what you might call a sort of, a sort of more medium risk, there could indeed be, there has indeed been an element of, of the rising tide lifting all boats. But I think you're absolutely right. You've got the likes of um, British Airways owner, International Consolidated, uh, Consolidated Airlines, as well as EasyJet. Both quality companies, notwithstanding the fact that EasyJet are probably going to be demoted again from the FTSE 100 imminently. But nonetheless, as we've just been discussing, their, their immediate recovery plans um, depend on a much broader psychological um, reason, which is whether travellers are going to have the confidence to be going abroad in the, in the shorter term. So um, they have, of course, been doing everything they can to contain costs, furlough staff where possible, uh, you know, remove the dividend, et cetera, et cetera. But the simple fact remains that companies such as those will have an element of fixed cost and with little to no revenues coming in, uh, puts them in a, 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 you know, in a fairly parlous state until it's time as the uh, traveling industry can even think about starting to recover. And in terms of um, the places where we've seen a, a success story uh, coming out of this, I guess it has to be the the shift to online, certainly within the retail and consumer space. Um, so companies that have managed to, to get ahead of the curve on that one um, are obviously going to be possibly a, a good place to be. Um, I mean, look at examples such as Boohoo, which managed to shrug off a short selling attack, it seems, last week with relatively relatively little ease. Um, but I guess also looking at companies that, that can have the ability to pivot to digital if they need to, rather than, as you said, being reliant upon rules that may be being created by, by someone else, such as the airlines, who, who until people are told they're allowed to travel again, They've, they've got real issue on their hands. And, and we have seen a couple of examples of companies, Marks and Spencer being an obvious one, who are actually accelerating what was part of their transformation plan anyway to become a bit more reliant on digital. They're actually taking this opportunity to accelerate before that. And quite apart from that, of course, and again, anecdotally, there, there seems to be some growing evidence that this, this pandemic has, has brought a whole new um, raft of people to using the net in the way that it was designed who might otherwise have stayed away the older generations for example um just something you could not have foreseen six months ago that even the very thought of uh, one's grandmother um getting into a zoom call um which is actually you know now now quite straightforward uh zoom shares as you can imagine have, have done just that um as indeed us tech shares in general both in terms of uh, those work at home stocks, which have benefited, um, plus the fact um, it's now becoming increasingly apparent that um, there are swathes of businesses uh, and indeed society which can actually um, be done remotely as opposed to physically. Um, and and the, um, as I say, the NASDAQ index, given the volatility that we've had in 2020 so far, uh, is now in positive territory in the year today. Yes, in, indeed. And, and we've even seen the scenario in the United States where uh, a certain man who stood to earn a very large sum of money from his company's share price by going up by a certain amount, even after its stratospheric rise, uh, Tesla managed to deliver Elon Musk a huge slug of money just as he sent two people into space. You couldn't, you couldn't write it better than that, <laughs> could you? 
no, absolutely. I look forward to reading that particular biography. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, that's all we've got time for. Thank you very much for joining us, Richard. Pleasure. And thank you very much for watching. Join us next time on The Investing Show. Goodbye. <laughs>